Romans 13, 1, and we've titled the message, The Christian's Responsibility Towards Government. Let's go to the Lord in prayer one more time, and then we'll get into our message. Heavenly Father, thank you as always for this time together. Thank you for your holy word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. God, I pray that you'll be with us as we look through your word and through these verses in this chapter. And Lord, prepare our hearts. It's a special worship service where we're going to celebrate and remember your sacrifice, Jesus, for us on the cross, your broken body, your shed blood to redeem us, to save us, Lord, to renew us to yourself, to give us eternal life. And so, Lord, even as we look through what you shared with us, Lord, by the Holy Spirit through Paul as he wrote this morning in this chapter, speak to our hearts, God, about your sacrifice, Lord Jesus, and what that should produce in our lives, Lord, as your people. And so we look to you, we love you, and just thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. So as you guys know, as a fellowship, we've been going through the book of Romans, and today we come to the 13th chapter. As we pick up where we left off from last week, Paul continues to detail what a life that's been surrendered to the Lord <clears throat> as a living sacrifice, which he defines as one who that no longer conforms to the pattern of the world, but is transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, will look like. So this is a continuation. In chapter 12, Paul begins to give us that picture of what that transformed life looks like by describing how those who are renewing their minds in Christ, they'll humbly serve one another in love, with the special abilities that the Holy Spirit has empowered them with. Whether it's the gift of prophecy, service, teaching, encouragement, generosity, leadership, compassion, or any other supernatural enabling of the Spirit, the purpose of these gifts is to supply the body of Christ with all that it needs to remain healthy and to function as God intended us to. Those who dedicate themselves to God as living sacrifices will demonstrate genuine love, affection, and deference to one another. They'll esteem others more highly than themselves. As they serve the Lord with diligence and passion, possessing a joyful anticipation of all that God's promised. What is he promised? That he'll come back again. Just like Joseph said, Jesus said, if I go, I'll come back for you. He's gone to prepare a place for us that where he is, one day we may be also. And so those who serve the Lord, they have that joyful anticipation. We're anticipating coming into everything he's promised. And so their life is, as they live with that joyful anticipation, their life should be marked with patience in tribulation, steadfastness in prayer. We should be given to hospitality and ready to meet the needs of God's people. And then as he got toward the end of chapter 12, he said, instead of engaging in revenge or retaliation, God's people trust in the Lord to repay the wicked. They don't think it's their job. They don't take it upon themselves to give retribution. They, they say, Lord, <laughs> I'm going to leave that to you. That's safe in your hands. I commit that to you. They don't return evil for evil as much as possible. They live at peace with, with all people as much as it depends on us. So there shouldn't be any conflict with others if we, if it's within our control to make it right. 
And we know with with relationships, you're gonna we're gonna have conflict with other people, and there's times when peace is not possible. But Paul says the Christian should be one as much as possible. They should live at peace with other people. So if it's in your if the ball's in your court, do what's right. Say you're sorry. Humble yourself. Make it right with people. And, you know, rather than returning evil for evil, don't let evil conquer you. Conquer evil with good. Don't be influenced by that evil to do evil. And how often is that our temptation when someone does us wrong? We're immediately tempted to, all right, that's all you want to do. I, we can do that. But the Bible says we shouldn't be that way. That's being conquered, right? Letting someone's sin drag us down to that level to become sinful ourselves. And how do you hate that within yourself when that happens? And you think, I've been a Christian this long and I'm still doing the same old thing. They're treating me poorly and I'm responding poorly. That's being conquered by evil. Don't be conquered by evil. Conquer evil by good. Live in a supernatural way, in a different way. It shows that you're marked by Christ. You're transformed. And so now he continues. So in addition to all these beautiful supernatural qualities. And so we already had a lot of homework from last week. If you look at everything that he talks about in chapter 12, that's already a lot to keep us busy, right? But Paul's not done. There's more to what living this life looks like. And so in addition to all these beautiful supernatural qualities that people who live fully surrendered to God should possess, Paul's going to add three more attributes of the Christian life in this chapter. <clears throat> Number one, Submission to the governing authorities. Then he goes on, he talks about our outstanding obligation to fulfill the royal law of love and a commitment to be clothed with Christ only. When I was putting this message together, you ever go to the buffet, you're hungry and your eyes are bigger than your stomach? And you grab, you want to grab all this and load your plate? That's kind of how I felt with Romans 13. I was like, oh, wow, I want to talk about submitting to government. I want to talk about fulfilling the royal law. I want to talk about being clothed with Christ. But then I thought, you know, I better better reel it in, and we're not going to rush through it. So this morning, we're just going to go through uh, looking at the Christian's responsibility to government. There's There's so much just in that that speaks to us as Christians. Just So we'll be staying within the first seven verses today of Romans 13. And how practical, how fitting, how much application, and you think about the political climate, um, it's an election year. So this has a lot of great instruction for us as Christians. So if you're there, Romans chapter 13, we'll start with verse 1. And like we said, this section is all about submission to government. Verse 1, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that that exist are appointed by God. So really, this, this mandate is for everyone. All people, whether they're Christian or not, but he's talking to Christians. And so this is what every rational citizen, how they should live. But this is especially, how much more so should it make sense? And should it be the way that we live as Christians within whatever society, whatever country, whatever time that we live within? As Christians, Paul says we have an obligation. This is not just a suggestion or a good idea. We have an obligation to be subject to our human governments. 
because the authority to judge criminal behavior and to punish lawbreakers has been given to man by God. Without that authority and without that structure and the stability that it brings, how rapidly would our society devolve into anarchy and chaos without those laws? Just think about one one particular instance. What if there was no signal lights, no stop signs, no instructions about how we're supposed to drive? How much chaos would it just be going from here, trying to drive through downtown Modesto and then survive and get out the other side? Right? That would be taking your life in your own hands. That would be chaos. That would be anarchy. But as, you know, as bad as things can seem sometimes, because we get this, we're prone to the woe is me, where our society is headed, our culture, you know, the demise of, remember what it used to be like. And then the older you are, the further back you could go back to the good old days. And then you think about what it's like. Now, we're prone to that, right? To this pessimism. And part of it is warranted, but I'm just saying we're prone to it regardless. Just think what our situation would be like without the God-given authority of government to deal with all the situations that it must. In his wisdom, God established human government shortly after the flood. And he spoke to Noah and he gave this decree in Genesis 9-6. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. And so we've been given the authority to deal with everything from the most serious capital offenses all the way down to the minor infractions and the violations of the law. And so if we've been given the authority by God to know how to correctly handle something as heinous as murder, So that basically God has given us the authority to deal with all the situations that arise in a society. Now, in saying that there is no authority that exists except by the permission of God, is Paul saying that all governments and all regimes are good and that he approves of all rulers? No, of course not. This is not a blanket endorsement of everything that takes place in the realm of government. By no means. It's not what Paul's saying. God never approves of corruption, abuse, brutality, or tyranny. But think about it. Generally speaking, any government at all, even a bad one, is better than no government at all. Would you agree? You look around the world, even if it's not the best government, it's better than having zero government. And what would come out of that? How would we interact? I mean, how does anyone even know how to... What's the rules? How do you play the game if you don't know the rules, right? It doesn't last very long that way. Not only is the institution of government God ordained. This is something very interesting to note what Paul says. But those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. Does it make you sit and go, what are you what were you thinking, God? You know, don't shout any names, right? But think about people you're thinking. God chose you to be whatever, the president, you know, the governor, whatever it is, the chairman. Proverbs 16.33 says, and it's funny, a lot of what we talked about uh, both yesterday in the men's ministry today in Sunday school just really dovetails really wonderfully in this message. Proverbs 16.33 says, 
we may cast the lots or we may roll the dice, but God determines how they fall. And then Proverbs 16.1 says, we can make our own plans, but the Lord gives the right answer. And so as we've seen over and over in the scripture, while God allows us to make meaningful choices, who controls the outcome? The Lord does. God controls the outcome. And because he controls it, it doesn't mean that we're not making legitimate choices, meaningful choices that we should, and it's our duty to make. While we have the right and the responsibility to vote for our elected officials, God appoints whomever he chooses. So we shouldn't just say, well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if God controls the outcome. Why should I even show up to the polls? Why should I mail in my ballot? What difference does it make? God says, you don't say that. You have a part to play. But so do I. But he's sovereign. He's Lord of all. And we've, we've gone through that and we've seen that through Romans, the tension in the scriptures. But just because God is sovereign and he's guiding the outcome of all events never means that our choice is meaningless, insignificant, that we shouldn't show up and do what is right. And by the way, it does something good for us to take a stand and do what's right. Just the fact that you do that. Don't you do that sometimes just by principle? Even if you think, hey, I'm, I'm voting for the person that's not going to win. Don't you still show up and vote for the person that you really think you should? And does it mean something to you and others? Yeah, it does. God appoints whomever he chooses, though. And given this is an election year, hopefully understanding this will help you keep your blood pressure down. If you're someone who gets highly agitated and frustrated by everything political, if that's you, and already, I mean, already my sermon is making your blood pressure go up. You're like, dude, really? I vote, but God controls the outcome. You're already feeling the tension, right? <clears throat> What's Paul's advice? Take a deep breath. Relax. Chill out. Do your homework. Vote for the best candidate that's available on the ballot. Even if that means voting for the lesser of two evils. And leave the results to God. But Lord, what if so-and-so ends up in the White House? We're doomed. Well, even if so-and-so does end up in the White House, does the Lord not still have the whole world in his hands? Just because so-and-so or whatever got into this political position, does that mean that, oh man... We're going to hell in a handbasket, and God, we had a chance, but God, we're, we're on the losing side. No, God still has the whole world in his hands. Remember the advice of King David in Psalm 37. This is a psalm, very relaxing, will make you feel very relaxed if you're feeling you know, frustrated, stressed, agitated. King David was someone who knew all about God appointing someone to power, who became jealous, paranoid, unpredictable, and violent. So David, he's a good source to, to listen to his advice, what he, what he pens by the Holy Spirit in this psalm. Listen to these words. Don't fret because of evildoers. Are you somebody who frets? Oh, wringing your hands and whatever you do, chewing your nails off or yelling at the TV screen or slamming the phone down or whatever. Are you fretting? Pacing back and forth in your living room, <laughs> shouting? Nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, 
for they shall soon be cut down like grass and wither as the green herb. Don't do that. Do this. Trust in the Lord and do good and dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. So in other words, don't fret. That That's not productive. Trust in the Lord. Do good. Feed on his faithfulness. Be productive for him. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. He was already saying in the previous chapter, don't take matters into your own hands. Don't blow up the polling station or something radical, right? That is not the solution. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. Stop being angry. Turn from your rage. Don't lose your temper. It only leads to harm. For the wicked will be destroyed, but those who trust in the Lord will possess the land. Soon, the wicked will disappear. And though you look for them, they will be gone. There's no future in that. It's not enduring. That's not a lasting legacy. But the humble, the meek, the lowly will possess the land and live in peace and prosperity. Do you feel a little bit better? No matter who is in control and who's in power and who's not. Rest in the knowledge that God is guiding the course of all human events. Take comfort in the wisdom of Solomon. The Lord has made everything for his own purposes, even the wicked, for a day of disaster. You know that God can use the righteous just and, and just as much he can use the unrighteous for his own plan, for his own his own purposes. When we look at it, we think oh, that doesn't make sense. But God's not asking for our opinion or consulting with us. He knows what he's doing. He's in control. And because of all these things, verse 2, Therefore, whoever resists the authority, resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. And I know we say that, but do we believe that? Do we believe, we say, well, God's going to you know, guide the outcome of this, or God will guide the outcome of who's going to be the next president, or who's going to be in control. But do we really believe that? Because if we really believe that, we shouldn't be resisting in a way, you know, that to resist and try to block it in an unhealthy way is to try to resist God. You're fighting against God. And those who do that, they bring judgment on themselves. Verse 3, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of authority? Do what's good and you will have praise from the same. For he is... God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. How do you prevent your pulse from spiking and your palms from immediately sweating every time you see the CHP sitting on the side of the freeway with a radar gun pointing at you as you just drove by. <laughs> you got it. Drive the speed limit. Do what's good. And you won't be anxiously looking in the rear view mirror over your shoulder for the one who beareth not the sword in vain. If I get pulled over, I know it's all, it's all over. History has proven again and again. There's no way I'm talking my way out of anything. In fact, if I start doing that, I might, I, you might try to give me some fix-it tickets. 
if I start going that that route. He beareth not the ticket book in vain. He's writing me up. One time, after receiving a speeding ticket, as I was simply enjoying a peaceful eastbound ride on Highway 132 on a beautiful sunny afternoon without another soul in sight, it's like the coast is clear. It's a beautiful. I'm just going down the road. I'm minding my own business. I get pulled over. I receive a speeding ticket. I don't try to get out of it. I take it. We drive off. And my wife turns and says to me, wasn't he a nice officer? <laughs> I'm like, are you serious right now? You're going to seriously tell me that? You can already see my jaw bulging. My knuckles, I'm just, wasn't he the nicest officer? He was so polite when he gave me that ticket. I was thinking, no, he wasn't. I was thinking, <clears throat> literally, I was thinking I'd like to pinch his head off. You know, maybe if he had slapped me on the wrist and just gave me a warning, I would think, that guy was cool. Yeah, that, that guy was, yeah, he's pretty nice. Whether or not the authorities are nice, like the good CHP officer who pulled me over. William McDonald writes, the ruler, and so here's who might be the ruler, the president, governor, mayor, or judge, is a minister of God in the sense that he is a servant and representative of the Lord. You see, that CHP officer was a representative of the Lord. He may not know God personally. It doesn't mean he's a Christian. But he is still the Lord's man officially. Officially, he is God's man, his representative. And thus, David repeatedly referred to the wicked King Saul as the Lord's Anointed. He wasn't saying, I think he's a godly man. He says, I recognize that God has put him in this position. And therefore, I, if I resist him in an ungodly way, I am resisting and fighting against God. This man, although wicked, has been appointed by God. In spite of Saul's repeated attempts on David's life, the latter would not allow his men to harm the king. You know, he even felt conviction when he was hiding in the cave. You remember, and Saul went in there to relieve himself. And David crept up and he cut the edge of his garment off. And then he showed it to him, proving if I wanted to kill you, I could have. Your, your life was in my hand. He even felt conviction that he had done that. Why? Because Saul was the king, and as such, he was the Lord's appointee. That should speak a lot to us in our modern age. Aren't you thankful for the examples of the Bible? You know, what they endured gives us so much perspective. It gives us comfort. Right? It removes our, I'm not going to put up with this. And they're like, okay, wait a minute. King David, he was a man after God's own heart. What did he do? Oh, wow. So should I harbor this ungodly attitude in my heart towards government? McDonald continues, as servants of God, rulers... This is what they're expected to do. Promote the good of the people. Their security, tranquility, and general welfare. If any man insists on breaking the law, he can expect to pay for it because the government has the authority to bring him to trial and to punish him. In the expression, he does not bear the sword in vain. We have a strong statement concerning the power which God has vested in government. 
The sword is not just an innocuous symbol of power. The sword is not just symbolic. We would say the gun. Right? That's what they don't carry. The peacekeeper and enforcer doesn't carry a sword, but he carries a gun. A gun is not a symbolic symbol. A sword's not a symbolic symbol of power. A scepter is a symbolic you're like, oh, look at my super fancy, beautiful scepter. Yeah, maybe you could whap somebody with it, but you know, it's not like a sword. It's not like a gun. The sword seems to speak of the ultimate power of the ruler, that is, to inflict capital punishment. And so it will not do to say that capital punishment was for the Old Testament era only and not for the new. Here's a statement in the New Testament that implies that government has the authority to take the life of a capital offender. You know, as a side note, in a similar, similar way, Joseph did an excellent job yesterday in the men's ministry exploring this idea of whether the God of the Old Testament is the same as the God of the New Testament. And he, as he shared that message, he was sharing about we can have this concept and, and he teasingly said it's a hippie idea that the God of the New Testament is all about love and mercy and gentle Jesus exclusively. But God of the Old Testament, he's grumpy, he's angry. He's looking for someone to smack. Right? Smack around. But he read to us about how God revealed the nature of himself for the very first time in the Bible. He said, Moses, I want to reveal to you who I am. Let me tell you who I am. This is my nature. This is my character. And he passed by Moses and he said, the Lord, the Lord God merciful and gracious and long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clear, clearing the guilty. In other words, the unrepentant, because we're all guilty. But he won't clear those who won't repent. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generations. And so, this idea of, um, you know, whether in the New Testament we can have such a thing as, so in the same way as like, oh, God is love in the New Testament, but he's mean and harsh and judgmental in the Old Testament, that's false. And he gave us many examples of God's grace to many people, and we just kept naming them and naming them and naming them. In the same way, we shouldn't have this misconception that God's representative, you know, he's going to sweep, you know, our infractions under the carpet, and that, it, you know, yeah, the grumpy old God of the Old Testament, he was like, yeah, capital punishment. But somehow in the New Testament, he's changed. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is loving, but he's also just, and he's fair, and he's, he's the judge. And so people argue against this idea of whether there's capital punishment in the New Testament, quoting Exodus 20, verse 13. And in the King James, it says, Thou shalt not kill. But the commandment refers to murder. The Hebrew word translated kill in the King James specifically means murder. And so it's translated in the New King James. It's a little clearer for us to understand. You shall not murder. That's the prohibition. Murder, not killing. Capital punishment was prescribed in the Old Testament law as the required punishment for certain offenses. Again, the apostle reminds us that the ruler is God's minister, but this time he adds an avenger to execute wrath 
on him who practices evil. In other words, in addition to being a minister of God to us for good, keeping the peace, providing structure, a society that we can function within all these things, he also serves God by dispensing punishment to those who break the law. And so that's the sense in which he is God's minister. It doesn't mean that he could be a Christian, he could not be a Christian. He could be a godly person, not a godly person. But in that capacity, he's God's minister to do you good or execute judgment and wrath. If you're a lawbreaker who won't turn away from that, you have to be dealt with. Verse 5, therefore, you must be subject. And not only just because of wrath, not just because if you break the law, you know, um, you're going to get that ticket, you'll have to pay the fine, and then your insurance will go up unless you uh, go to traffic court, you know, or, or do the online traffic school, you know, and try to keep the points off. He's saying, don't just obey only for that reason. The only reason, you know, you're not, <laughs> you're not obeying, uh, you know, or you're obeying is so that you don't get caught. It's like, that's not the only reason, but not just because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. Do the right thing. Be subject so that you have a clear conscience before God because you know in your heart it's the right thing to do whether you got caught and punished or not. As Christians, we should obey, not to only avoid punishment, but also for conscience' sake, to maintain a good witness before God and others. That way you don't feel condemned. Before God, you don't feel phony, you know, in dealing with others because you're like, you know, you're not doing, you're not practicing what you preach. As my wife faithfully reminds me when I'm driving and I happen to speed or talk on my cell phone and I'm not using the speaker, I have it to my ear, or occasionally maybe I perform a Hollywood stop, you're a pastor! You need to be a good example for the flock. <laughs> and I do remember when we came back from Guatemala. I don't know how it happened. I'm going to blame it on jet lag. It was late at night. We're in Escalon. Watch out when you don't think there's a soul in sight. I swear I stopped. But the officer was very convinced. Somehow I went through the stop sign. I mean, it's like 11 at night on a Sunday night in Escalon downtown. There's not a person around. And I turn in and I get pulled over like that. I'm like, whoa, what? There's nobody out here. I didn't even see headlights. What's going on? And he's like, we've had a lot of problems with this intersection. We got to stop people like you. Hey, it happens. And then I was working super hard as a pastor to not have a super bad attitude because I had all the missionaries. We just went to Guatemala. I was trying my best to be accept my punishment, be subject to the governing authorities with a good attitude. It was a struggle. I know Brett's laughing. Brett was there. He he witnessed the whole thing. Well, <laughs> hey, that hey, that's off the record. I can't be tried twice for that. It's a moot, moot point. But, uh, you know, I might have shown a good example by saying, guys, I'm sorry that, you know, I got a little, I got a little upset over the situation. That was my good example. Verse 6. Enough about my problems. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. And so, as Christians, not only do we owe the government scripturally our obedience, but our financial support as well. Do you appreciate living in a society of law and order with police, fire protection, emergency services, civil servants, and all these things? If you do, 
as God appointed officials, they're tasked with providing these services that we enjoy. It's our duty to support all those who serve in those ways. That's how they earn their living, right? You like to be paid when you do your job. Is that correct? You think you owe, you think, you know what I mean? You've earned it. It's your wage. They kind of feel the same way. In fact, they even have one, you know, branch that helps make sure, you know, one service makes sure we all pay our taxes, right? They're serious about getting their paychecks too. But God says, you should support those who give their lives as civil servants to provide these services for you. And by the way, most of them are doing the very best they can. Whether they're a Christian or not, they are in that office because that's their calling. They're doing their best. Not everybody, you know, but that's anything in life. Verse 7, therefore, because of that, because you like to enjoy all the services and it's the right thing to do and it honors God, render therefore to all their due. Taxes to whom taxes are due. Customs to whom customs. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. Does that remind you of uh, someone else who said something that was similar to that? It reminds us of when the Pharisees plotted how to trap Jesus with a controversial question. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God and truth. You don't care about anyone. You don't regard the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? or not, they were trying to trap Jesus, right? Divide his support, get him in trouble, get him arrested. But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. Somebody got a coin. So they brought to him a denarius. He said to them, whose image is on this inscription? They said, Caesar's. And he said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And so don't try to tell me about how you know you can get your way out of paying taxes and all the stuff. I don't want to hear it. Take it from Jesus. Give to Caesar what's Caesar's. Give to God what's God's. Do you enjoy the benefits of a society that maintains law and order? Then we should be willing to support it. Now, is there a limit? to our submission to the government? Is there a boundary? If cross with which we must take exception to submitting to the government authorities? Yes. Whenever it violates or interferes with our obeying, serving, and or worshiping the Lord. Really quick, a classic example of civil disobedience because of religious conviction. We find one of the most famous ones, Acts chapter 3. You remember Peter and John were going up to the temple about the hour of prayer to worship. They're passing through a gate that was called the Beautiful Gate. And there was laid at that gate a beggar who had been lame from birth. And, and as they were walking by, Peter, they made I, Peter says, look at me. He goes, I know you want money. I don't have money. I'm going to give you something way better in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth rise up and walk and he was healed by the power of the holy spirit by the power of god and he stood up and he was leaping and jumping and he was like any of us would he was having the time of his life and they all made their way in and it caused this big old huge crowd what's going on well you know this guy he's been here begging forever right you know him joe at the beautiful gate joe the beggar well he's healed and praising god and so, because of this huge crowd, Peter takes the opportunity and he pre preaches his second sermon and everybody's loving it. Everyone's going crazy. Well, who hears about it? The Pharisees. The, the religious council, the Sanhedrin. And uh, they're not very happy about it, so they arrest them, they drag them in, and they interrogate them. And they're like, they, they command them, you are not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus anymore. You do not do that. You don't just go around 
you know, healing people and having revivals and getting people getting saved. You just don't do that. That's our domain. If we want to do that, we'll do that. And we don't want to do that, so we don't do it. And so you don't do it. We're in charge, not you. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And then later, next chapter, they have another encounter with the same religious council. And the high priest asked them again, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. And then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. While the life that Jesus calls us to, it truly is radical. It truly is revolutionary. Including the need to at times refuse to obey the laws that are contrary to God. What it never is, the life that He's called us to as Christians who live as a living sacrifice, it's never a call to rebellion. It's never a call to the overthrow of any government by violence or force. God never, we're not authorized to do that. He doesn't call us to do that. When Jesus was being interrogated before Pontius Pilate, He asked Jesus, Are you the King of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, Are you speaking about this uh, yourself? Or did others tell you this about me? And Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. They would be radical, revolutionary rebels. But my kingdom is not this world that I should not be delivered to you Jews or to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. And so we talked about this again. We talked about this in in Sunday school. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood enemies but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Our true enemy is spiritual, is the devil, is demonic, is Satan and his uh, forces. It's not with human governments or regimes. But the Bible says we're to... Pray for and intercede for kings and all who are in authority that we may lead quiet and peaceful lives. And so, are we to try to be an influence in the means available to us? With the freedom of speech, with with voting, with these different ways. Yeah, that's, that's how we are a blessing to the world and to the government. But we're so, we're supposed to, you know, support, subject ourselves, honor, pay our taxes, and be good citizens. The only prohibition is to violate a clear and direct command of God. You know, so if they said, you cannot worship the Lord anymore, we would have to say, we're going to worship the Lord, come what may. We'll have to accept uh, those consequences. And by the way, they do that in countries all over the world to this day, don't they? Um, This is a great, great passage, very instructional. Before we go uh, to the Lord's Supper, thinking about this whole idea of, you know, governments and how they're required to control society, population, and bring judgment to maintain order i've been watching this show about a guy who was wrongly convicted of a murder in the uk he served 
Well, he, he had a sentence of life without parole. True story. After 12 years, he was able to prove his innocence. He was released, exonerated. He's a journalist, and now he spends his time go- traveling around the world and going to the toughest prisons for a week. He goes in there and lives with them. And he and the thing that he's searching and looking for is how is what he calls the regime or the the authorities, the wardens, the governor of the prison, how are they... What are they doing to rehabilitate, you know, these prisoners? And what's interesting is, you know, every one of them has an interesting story. And that, it, it reminds me of, uh, you know, he's in there with these guys who they've, they've done what they've done. He hears their story. He has compassion on them. I can't help but think about our Savior Jesus who came to give his life as a sacrifice for the guilty. He came, it's interesting, this guy puts himself in their cell, in their place, eats their food, sleeps in their conditions. He understands if it's cramped, if it's, you know, if it's brutal, how they're treated, whatever it is, he's in there with them. He's not, has no exception. Jesus came to totally identify with us, except that he was without sin. He came to love us, to redeem us, to understand our situation. He understands everything about us. And Jesus didn't come to overthrow the government or do any of that. He gave his life. He could have could have obliterated Rome, but he didn't. He gave his life in sacrifice so that he could redeem us. And what a what a beautiful <clears throat> savior we have what a great example of Jesus who gave rendered unto Caesar what was Caesar's. He was subject to the governing authorities of his day there in Rome. And yet he rendered unto God, under God what was God's perfect example, perfect humility. Uh, and with that, Ponce, would you come up and, and lead us in, in the Lord's Supper? Thank you, Pastor. You now, once a month, we celebrate the, the death and burial and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I often read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And there's a warning there that tells us not to partake of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. And... Well, today we, we learn about being subject to authority and, and uh, our government. And oftentimes, do we rebel against that and think it's okay to come and celebrate the Lord's Supper? It's not okay. You've got to... What, what did Pastor say? I wrote it down. Give me a sec here. He said we have to make it right with people. And he started. And so if, if this is us, you know, if... if, if we tend to cringe at our government. <clears throat> no, we shouldn't. We should praise the Lord that we live in this great country. And um, and praise the Lord that we're able to, to do this publicly. You know, once a month, I often think, what am I going to talk to our church about? <laughs> and I pray to the Lord, Lord, what would you have me preach to or talk to the to your people about before we partake of the Lord's Supper. And I never get an answer, ever. <laughs> I never hear anything audibly, ever. But this morning, for those of you who were not at Sunday school, we started to read the book of Jonah. And as I was sitting there, all these words started to, to hit me. And Jonah chapter 1. It started off by saying that the Lord gave this message to Jonah. So today it would be, the Bible says, if we were reading it today, to us. Once the Lord is telling you this. And for Jonah, Jonah got up and he went the opposite direction. So he didn't listen to what the Lord told him. He did the complete opposite. And I like what Rick did today. Today he said, 
You know, because we can often look at Jonah and think, man, that guy, he's, he's, he's a bonehead for, for not listening to the Lord. But Rick brought it back to us, and he says, oftentimes do we not listen to the Lord? We sin every day. He's giving us direct commands, and we do the complete opposite. What kind of commands? How about loving one another? How about not having division? How about, what do we learn today? Respecting our authority, our government. And there's so many commands that we're, we're, we're supposed to follow. Loving the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. How about not having idols? I don't have any idols. What if we put something before the Lord? Can a girl or a guy be our idol? Can our television, sports, a whole bunch of stuff can be, become our idols, right? And we're commanding not to do so. And so Jonah, he does the complete opposite of what the Lord told him to do. And we all know the story. He gets on a boat, and the Lord causes a great storm to happen and catches their attention. And then towards the end, Jonah says to the, to the crew, throw me into the sea, and it will become calm again. I know that this terrible storm is all my fault. Brother Rick said he acknowledged his sin. And that's what today is about. Our Lord and Savior did something for us. This is for Christians here. Jonah's a Christian. Jonah's a follower of the Lord. And we too fall short of his glory. I know I do. Mentally, you know, physically. But the Lord is great. He's so merciful. And so before we partake of the Lord's Supper, what have we offended the Lord in? Towards the end, it says that the sailors picked Jonah up and they threw him into the raging sea and the storm stopped at once. The sailors were awestruck by the Lord's great power and they offered him a sacrifice and they vowed to serve him. They were saved towards the end. I've read this a number of times. I've never noticed that. And, and, and Rick brought that up today, how these people were saved because of what they saw in Jonah, what the Lord had done. Could you, could you imagine if, if the world sees that those Oasis people over there, they pay their taxes, they, they obey the government, they forgive one another, there's no division, they love one another. They're totally different. They ask for forgiveness. And that's what today's about. So before we partake of the Lord's Supper, let's take a minute to reflect on, on, on the prior month and confess your sin to the Lord. I know it sounds really simple, but that's all He wants, a broken and contrite spirit. He wants us to confess our sins to Him. And He promises to forgive us of our sins and to make us right with the Lord. Take a minute, please. Brother Pete, Brother Rick, can you join me? Please pass the bread.
On the night when Jesus was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took some bread and He gave thanks to God for it. He broke it into pieces and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Brother Rick, may you bless the bread. Father, as we take this symbol this morning, we do it in remembrance of Jesus giving His body. We also do it to support the future. Jesus is the bread of life. Amen. So he's coming back. So with both of those remembrance of his heart that we say this morning. Amen. Let me pass the juice. In the same way, Jesus took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this, is, this cup is a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. Brother Pete, will you bless the, the juice? Dear Heavenly Father, we drink of this cup. Remember that blood you shed so mercifully that did it on our behalf. Mm -hmm. And with that blood that our sins were So I appreciate all you've done for us. Keep showing me what you've given us. Praise the Lord.
important when we do communion that we're reminded of what Jesus did. As I go throughout my walk, I realize the thing that keeps bringing me back, keeps revitalizing me, is remembering and understanding what Jesus did. It's nothing, nothing new. It's the same thing, and it's still powerful. This song is about that. Lead me to the cross.
Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Daniel Martinez. I am representing Genesis Motorsports today, and I am going to be offering uh, a class for the youth and the young adults at, that are, well, I consider myself still a youth still. Am I on? Can you hear me? Okay, it's me. All right, uh, just a, I'll take a few minutes of your time, but I probably, uh, I just want to start with me so you guys get to know me a little bit about, uh, and about what we're offering here. Um, I started working for uh, BMW, Can Am Triumph, uh, Vespa, Piaggio, and I've been in the industry for about 20 years now. Um, I recently was going in a big project to purchase the BMW dealership. God had other plans for me, and uh, we started our own little individual shop. Um, and that brings me to the point why, I'm, why I am here. Um, we started a youth ministry, youth group that we uh, give kids the chance to ride um, an ATV. We supply everything, um, the quad, the gear, um, the safety lessons. Um, it's all for free. We want to donate it, and we're looking for some individuals that would like to join the class. There are, I believe, a few spots available that I had spoke with Ponzi about, um, but I, I don't want to take up too much of your time, um, and we want to show you a quick video. And if you guys are interested, please see me in the back, and uh, we can kind of talk about uh, if that'll work for you guys. And I believe we're looking for March 9th is the day that we're going to put it on. Um, 16th. 16th? 16th. Thank you. Way off. <laughs> okay, March 16th. And then the only thing that will permit that is if it, the weather is still raining and the track is flooded. Um, but yeah, uh, watch our video and let us know what you guys think. And any other questions, please give me a buzz in the back, and uh, I'd love to answer that for you. Thank you guys for having me.
and that we come back next Sunday ready to talk about how great you've been this week. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.